Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. And the music was playing, Blake, and it like uh, blanked out a couple times. So I don't know if we have a good stream or not. So I'm oh. going to talk oh. for a second. I'll, I'll give you a thumbs up or thumbs down if I feel like you cut out. But the music cut out a couple times. Seems good to me. I see you. I hear you loud and clear. Your lips match your, your voice. I think that's a good sign. That is a good sign. I have to ask you, David, how did you like your flight back from Chicago? You finally went and got TSA pre. <laughs> yes, I finally got TSA pre. It, and, and it was funny because I was, uh, uh, Michael Lee and I were going through TSA pre together. And he uh-huh. forgot to take a water bottle out of his bag. And I got to basically be like you or my wife when they're waiting on me to come through because they sent him through uh-huh. the line a second time. <laughs> and so I got to stand on the other side of TSA pre just waiting pointlessly for somebody else to come through security. So, but I got well, the, the back story. Experience. The backstory for our listeners who don't know is that I've had TSA pre for years. I love it. And David refused to buy, to pay for TSA pre for. I don't know how long it's been around, decades now. Since day because... one, and who it would pay for it, and I just refused. I refused to get it. It's not about the paying for it. My, It's more of a stubbornness of we all should get that service. Make a crappy line for them, everybody else, the, the suspected yeah. people. <laughs> well, and now they have clear. So you can yes. pay $189 every year if you want to skip the line. Um, it reminds me of like Disney Fast Pass. We've gotten to that level of airport security. But uh, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you are now a member of the club, and uh, you will not have to take your shoes off again. So congrats. <laughs> we were in Chicago for the Unique CPA Conference. The theme was Bridging the Gap. I had a great time. It was a lot of fun seeing our friends, and thank you to Randy Crabtree for putting that together and bringing us out there so we could be part of the event. I got to meet some listeners that I've never met before. Melanie came up to me and said hi and told me an amazing story about how she used AI. It wasn't for accounting, though. It was to resolve a Medicare dispute. She's dealing with health issues with a family member, and Medicare denied a claim. And, you know, you get that letter, and you have to respond. And it can be very difficult to know what to do. How do you write that letter to respond so that you're going to get the case resolved? Well, she dropped the letter into ChatGPT and said, help me write a reply to this Medicare dispute, and it worked. It gave her a great letter. She sent it off and resolved the issue. So it reminded me of how we used it to uh, draft that uh, letter to the IRS for our penalty abatement, David. I think it's a great use case. Anytime you've got those issues. So the AI on their end can scan it and decide what to do with it. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Well, the humans on there, right? Like, like we just like defer everything to some AI bots, and they solve all our th- problems. You think yeah. Medicare is using AI, David? Not yet. Yeah, who knows? But I, mean, I bet probably you insurance... for customer service or inbound stuff, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if the insurance companies start doing it. The health insurance companies uh, to process claims, um, probably much more accurate. I also met Chad at the conference. Chad's a CPA at Keeper. And he told me a story about his 150-hour requirement, how he got his extra 30 hours, because he didn't do a master's. His final class was beginner's walk slash jog. Yes, beginner's walk slash jog. Not advanced walk slash jog, beginner's walk slash jog. I'm trying to imagine, and, like, 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 how, hey, how, how did this even become a class? Because, like, if you're on campus, you're probably walking already. I don't know. Like, how did this? <laughs> Yelena, amazing. welcome. Yelena's here in the live stream. Yelena says, I have had global entry for four years now and enrolled in Clear this year. My credit card does cover the cost for both, so it's helpful. Oh, I need to check and see if my credit card does that. I might get it. Um, but back to back to the current story, this 150-hour requirement. Um, Chad then sent me in a follow-up email an actual picture of his transcript, and it really is him. there. Yeah, you're like, prove it. Show me the receipts. You were like, prove yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, so here it is on the screen for our YouTube viewers. KPED eleven forty-five beginning walking slash jogging, one semester hour, and he got an A in it. And he told me that all they did in this class was walk around campus for thirty minutes. 
There was no Amazing. education, no instruction, no discussion. They just walked around campus. Yeah. Right. Maybe maybe so, this is an important part of the 150 because that way, two years in, you can run from the accounting industry when you get burnt out. Maybe this is an <laughs> important thing, skill to have. Right. Well, Hewn Park in the comments, he said, how can you run the numbers or walk through a balance sheet if you haven't taken beginner walk <laughs> slash running? This is genius. Oh, what a way to kick this off. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so I always tell the story about how it was my intro to philosophy class that rounded out my 150 credits. And I credit that class with giving me the ability to question the nature of my reality and whether or not the 150 is even reasonable to ask of people and the ethics of requiring an extra 30 hours that are potentially meaningless. So I posted this on LinkedIn and I asked all of my followers all of our listeners, to tell us their stories. What class did they take to get the 150 that's even possibly more absurd than this one? And the responses are fantastic. Um, Wendy said, I took beginning and advanced bowling plus conditioning slash weight training for women. And that was because when, when they went back, it was 20 years after the bachelor's so had to go get the credits even though it was years and years later uh aaron said i took whitewater kayaking brad said i have uh an equivalency of a minor in geology thanks in part to lunar and planetary geology and alabama dinosaurs leslie from the minnesota society of cpa said and yet we are getting pushback for wanting to augment the rules here in minnesota I know we got some more. Is there fishing? Is there a fishing class? Like, that would be the best. K Casey from Dark Horse CPAs uh, got a, a credit for a bowling class and a class on the Beatles. Intro to piano. James said intro to piano. Now that resonated with me because I used my music credits to get a lot of my 150 because I was an undergraduate music major. Danny or Danny, said intro to gerontology, which is the study of old people, history of music, and That's art history. That's a good degree. That's probably a good one to have for, for our space. Right? It's good to understand the partners in particular, right? Yeah. The, uh, she said, interesting classes, but totally irrelevant to being a CPA and tax professional. Janet said, history of rock and roll at UNLV. Vladimir said, understanding jazz, what was supposed to be an easy A ended up being a tougher class than I expected, but I actually enjoyed it. Jazz is not easy. Jazz theory is harder than classical theory, in my opinion, and I'm a classical music major. Uh, scuba diving, Matthew took scuba diving, golf, and tennis for credit. Dion took women's studies. Erica took canoeing, vegetable gardening, national parks, and dinosaurs. And Pav took a humor studies class. Dinosaurs make sense, I, too. So there's more. <laughs> There's many more comments. This was a very popular post, so uh, I will have the link in the show notes if you would like to add your comment, and I would love to know what you did. Kevin in the live stream says, I was in one of the last paper slash pencil two-day marathon exam groups. Think I would have had to go back to school to complete 150 had I not passed. Oh, gosh, that would be terrible, right? Imagine you were in that group that failed the CPA exam right before the switchover. And then you had to go back and earn 30 semester hours because of that, I'd be terrified. Um, yeah, so that's my fun story. What you got, David? So I, I just reflecting on the conference a little bit. Um, so I, I'll, I'll start with a fun story, then I'll just a couple of observations. So the fun story okay. was because you weren't there this one night. Um, this conference was hand, all done at one hotel. So we didn't like leave and everybody was staying at the same hotel basically in, in Chicago at the Lowell's O'Hare. And, you know, just like every conference, people wind up in the hotel lobby, restaurant, bar. And there's a lot of accountants in there. A lot of the people that attend the conference are young and cool like Blake hanging around, you know. Well, there was this one table, these three really old guys at 1130 at night, full ties, buttoned up still. <laughs> and, and the joke was, we were kind of joking in the room, like, where's the table with the accountants? And like... 
<laughs> it looked like old senior member owners of, of firms. Well, I went up going over there. Um, we, ch we chatted them up, and it turns out it was actually an engineer, a doctor, and a surgeon. Um, but they were not accountants. But not it, there it for was, the conference. It was not like. Yeah, if you had a if you did not know and you were going to place money, you would place money on that table, not all the other tables that actually had accountants on it. So that was kind of the, the funny story there. Yeah. But but the observations I saw is outside people coming to the accounting industry. So I met, um, lack of better words, a PE guy, but I don't think he was PE. He's just a, a guy who bought an accounting firm, but no background in accounting, and now he has a cast practice, right? And uh, met somebody else who um, he was in the e-commerce space. He knows Merrill Johnson, who we had in the podcast a few weeks back, and saw like, oh, there's opportunity here to do accounting and bookkeeping services for e-commerce people. And he's kind of out of the e-commerce business, and he started a cast practice for e-commerce businesses. So, so meeting people at this small first-time conference that really were completely from outside of the space. Um, and yeah. the, so, so outside people are coming in to do accounting work that you don't need a CPA for. Right. And I saw a survey that backs that up. This is the latest CAS survey that AICPA does, or it might be CPA.com. And um, I might, we might have time to talk about it later, but this, the stat I saw was that about 50% of CAS staff and partners and anyone involved in a CAS practice are CPAs. It's only half. And that fits with the firm owners. I see, you know, half for CPAs, half for not, people coming from outside. This is a consequence of the talent shortage. We don't have enough CPAs to fill this need, this really fast growing segment. And so other people are seeing the opportunity and they're coming in, just like I did as a career changer. Now I did eventually go get my CPA, but it was a huge process. And a lot of people aren't, you know, willing to do that, go back and get the 30 hours or get the specific classes they have to have. It's it's a huge it's a big deal to do that, and it's a lot of red tape. So, um, interesting, interesting observation. Private equity is coming in, and it's not just at the big firm level; it's at small, smaller firms too. Uh, so, you know what I did on the way back from the conference, David? You on my flight TSA back, pre? Yeah. I went through TSA pre right. in like two minutes, and then I opened up my laptop in the terminal and I started doing my Arizona ethics class because my renewal was due at August 31st and I'd waited until the last day oh, you, to take really? the ethics like, class. Thank goodness you went to that conference too. <laughs> like, really? I know. I had to get my, well, and also uh, I just moved to Arizona a few years ago and this is my first renewal since moving my license over to Arizona from California. And so I wasn't really up on all the specific Arizona rules. And one of the rules that I became aware of earlier this month when I started looking into it was that 16 of your 80 CPE hours for your renewal period have to be in person or live webinars. And I've been earning all my CPE by doing this show and creating self-study courses, which don't count as live. So I needed to be at that conference so that I could earn my remaining live CPEs because apparently, for some reason, Self-study is not acceptable. You've got to be in a classroom in order to really be a qualified, educated accountant. But now so, that you're an Arizona CPA, you could get involved in the committees. In about five years from now, maybe self-study will be okay for Arizona. I, I would love that. Another quirk of the renewal process is that the renewal was due at 5 p.m. on the last day of the month. And it's by birth month. I'm born in August, so August 31st, 5 p.m. But I didn't see that 5 p.m. part. I thought it was midnight because you sound why like wouldn't it be? You my kid doing his homework. <laughs> you know, I, I just, you know, I made, I made, a, I, I made a assumption. And luckily, my flight landed before 5 p.m. And I submitted my renewal application at 4.57 p.m. Amazing. <laughs> And made it in timely. But I was thinking, why is it due at 5 p.m.? And then I realized it's because the rules are still based on when people have sent in paper forms and it's, it, it is received, when it is received in the office is the timestamp. So it has to make it to the before Arizona the office doors. Board of Accountancy before they close the office doors at 5 p.m. But they haven't changed that, even though now it's an online process. So I did it. I'm going to be a CPA for another two years at least. 
Uh, it's good. We, we don't have to, I don't have to rebrand and go remove CPA off your name in thousands of places we have it. It's, uh, this is actually good for us. I got one more thing to add about that, though, because yeah. it was like a four, it was a four hour ethics course. And um, we haven't yet got ethics up on Earmark, so I couldn't take it through Earmark. I, and it's a state specific thing. Um, sorry, we do have ethics up on Earmark, but we don't have Arizona state specific ethics and the ASCPA specific ethics. So I had to take a self study course from another provider and pay some money. And when I got the course, it was just a big PDF file, a giant PDF, and then a copy of the test. They gave me a copy of the test along with the PDF. And then the way I proved like that I PDFs, earned my basically. two PDFs. Okay. And then the way I would earn my credit was I would take a 20 question online test and I'd had to get, I had to get 75% or better or was it? Yeah. I think it was 75%. So they gave me the test. They gave me the PDF. It counts for four hours, but you could just drop those 20 questions into an AI and say, give Don't me the me did that. <laughs> correct answers. Well, I didn't do it to start. So first of all, the test was extremely poorly designed such that anyone with any test taking skills could eliminate at least two of the answers of okay. the four multiple choice questions immediately. And most of, most of the time, three of them. So I just went, I went through, I read, I read the PDF and I went through and I took the test and then I dropped the entire test, copy pasted it into an AI and I said, give me the answers, and I checked my answers versus its answers, and we got the same answers, and I submitted now, it Now, did you passed. give the AI the study guide, too, or did you just give it the questions? No, I just gave it the questions. It didn't even have the study guide or the course materials. Yeah. So AIs can pass an ethics exam, too. I learned that. Wow. Yeah. It's a, a big jump. But it just made me realize, like, how poor the ethics experience is because if you had no ethics you could very easily just take the exam and be done with it and not have ever even read the materials i mean that's been i mean there's been big firms that this has been going on right people cheating on the ethics exam right yeah like, this is not well, <laughs> you're not the first person to think of trying that blake i mean uh, i know like, it's happened it's just it's thousands it's crazy and thousands of times the thing that's uh, sort of strange for me is that we have this profession that is supposed to be super ethical, but we set up a system that allows you to succeed by being really unethical. So the system is unethical. If you actually apply ethical thinking to the system of how we do CPE and how we test people on ethics, when you have a system that enables rampant cheating, the system itself is broken and unethical. Yeah. It's unethical to maintain that system. And yet that's what we have in accounting. And we wonder why we have an ethics problem in accounting. Maybe it's because the system is designed to reward unethical behavior. Yeah, it's one of those unintended consequences. Everything has them. Yeah. Yeah. So you have, David, a fun video to play. Yeah, I mean, not everything is uh, bad news. Um, and I think this is, a, since we're on the fun theme and we've been laughing a lot let's keep it going um, mm -hmm. so we have a video so this is danielle booker phd cpa apparently i don't know how long ago this was it looks like it was recent um sometime mid-august she was on the wheel of fortune that's amazing yeah. okay i've got the clip here this was on yeah, linkedin you sent me you sent me this um and i saw it also when jennifer wilson posted it up and i think people tagged us in it they're like you got to play this yeah. on the show so we're, we're okay so this is an account this is an accountant who was on wheel of fortune and uh you are an accounting professor yes i'm an accounting professor i teach accounting and auditing and i'm really trying to get students to know that accounting is fun and it's not just number crunching <laughs> and it's the language of business you have a great opportunity by having a degree it, in accounting is that a tough sell it is. It is. You know, I'm trying to get it out there right nope, now. But you had me convinced there. And remember, everybody, accounting is fun. Yes. All right. Let's do another toss-up. Oh accounting my God! I got to clip fun. that. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna clip that. And remember, everybody, accounting is fun, and we got to put that at the beginning of every episode. <laughs> every episode. Uh, remember, so, so Blake and David, accounting is fun. Yeah. So there's that article, which was really positive. Um, there was an article in a, a Business Journal magazine, but it had. Um, uh, 
Christina Spell, who's now, she just took over as the Maryland Association of CPA. She's the new chair. And Sorry, she before believed, that, oh. before that, did we say the name of the professor who was in this video? I did before Fortune? you pressed play. But say okay, good. Dan, was it Danielle Booker? Yes. Okay, Danielle Booker, PhD, over at Loyola. Sorry, continue. I know. It's all right. And so just to stay on this theme, so the new uh, chair of the Maryland Association CPA is Christine Aspel. She, you know, she's in this article and she talks about how the industry needs to start reaching out to the next generation of potential accountants earlier to change the narrative of accounting the profession. And so that's, so with Pat Sajak saying something like, something like that, that's helping to change the narrative. And really she, she, she frames this up as like, it used to be where colleges would try to create the impression on young people of what accounting should be or accountants should be. And she's like, but that's not happening because by the time kids are even at college, they've already learned from Hollywood how boring and unfun accountants are. Or like yeah. we had last week, they're learning from their accounting teachers in high school that accountants are miserable. So, so she wants to smash that narrative. And there was two other articles besides Wheel of Fortune this week. So there was an article, Going Concern picked this up. So I'm gonna mess up this name. Eugene Amodadzi, he, uh, is the world's fastest number cruncher. So he qualified to, um, so he is a 100 meter at the World Athletics Championships. He's 31 years old. Um, he basically learned that he was fast by running to catch the bus. <laughs> and so lots of accountants, which is really crazy, a lot of accountants have reached out to say, congratulations, you're representing accounting, accountants very well, but he has yet to get a new job offer. <laughs> <laughs> which is a little, a little bit of an issue. So, and he's, he's, you know, he's, he's like, we're not boring stiff squares at the office typing. Like, it's another positive article about accounts. That's great. Does it say what his, what his job is? Like, where does he work? What does he do in accounting? Oh, he's I just British. focused on his running stuff. He's a British accountant. That's what we know. And he's There's 31. an interview, but there's too much wind, oh. so don't play it. It's it's really hard. Okay. There's too much wind in the background. He's actually at the track, getting an interview. It's just it's a little. It won't be good to play on the show. Oh, it says he works for a subsidiary of Berkeley Group St. George PLC. They have been phenomenal. Honestly, I am always on top of my workload. I never slip behind. But if I need to jet off somewhere to in Europe to race at short notice, they are very accommodating of it all. I won't lie and say that it doesn't get tough at times, and sometimes you do feel like you are stretched quite thin. But my missus is incredible. <laughs> What a great guy. And it's great that his firm gives him the time to fly around and race. See, that's a good story, David. And All right, now I've got to take us. i got one more good feel-good okay. story. Or, or then good can I take here. us down? I'll take us down after you take uh, us up. Okay, yeah, one more. So this was actually in um, HBCU Lifestyle Black College Living. So it's a non-accounting mag, right? And mm -hmm. the title of the article said, No Cubicles Here, The Shockingly Sun-Kissed Life of Digital Nomad Accountants. And Ooh. basically, it's an article. It might be a paid article. It's from a company called Accounting Plus. So it's like they might be like a cast coaching community or sales coach type thing. But it goes on to talk about the nomadic lifestyle you can have because of cloud accounting, how you can do beach accounting. And it really talks up all the tools that are available to have this magical lifestyle. And it's just another example of like, hey, we got they're projecting a new image to people that normally would not know about this space. Right. Mm -hmm. This is great. Uh, Hopefully, there's, I don't want you to bring us down. This is a, we're in a good, a good kick here. Sorry, David, but I can't control the news. And we can only control the narrative so much as a profession. You can talk up accounting, you can talk up audit, but if the job itself doesn't live up to expectations, you're just going to create a situation where you're lying to people about the reality of it. And I believe that one of the fundamental problems we have is that two-thirds of accounting grads go into audit, this is in the United States, two-thirds of them go into audit, and they are auditing mostly large public companies, and the audit profession in many ways is broken. People don't read audit opinions, audit has become commoditized, it doesn't create value, it doesn't detect fraud, investors don't rely on audits, and the financial statements that are being audited have become less and less useful over time. And you may not see this, discussion happening in public in the United States, but it's really happening in Australia, where there have been some major, major scandals recently, to the point where ABC News in Australia did a 15-minute investigative story called 
A decline in the big four's auditing quality stokes fears of an Enron-style corporate collapse. So in this day and age of 12-second videos, 15 is, they, they invest a lot of time in this. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I saw a 15-minute segment on NBC News or anything like that. So I just wanted to play some of this video. And David, I'm going to use you as a barometer. Just interrupt when you get bored, because I assume that's when our listeners will get bored. Okay. And then um, we can link to the rest of it in the show notes. We won't play all 15 minutes. Oh, it's a beautiful boat and a beautiful lake. These tranquil waters are a sanctuary from the cut and thrust of corporate life. I love, you know, going out in my little boat. When you're in a bad place, you dwell on those bad things that got you there. So going out on the water takes that away a bit. Tony Watson's career as a tax lawyer fell apart when he accused a construction giant of incorrectly claiming hundreds of millions of dollars in tax deductions. I told them that they were stealing from our children. They were stealing from taxpayers. It cost him his job as a senior partner at a top-tier law firm. I didn't seem capable of being shut up voluntarily, so they had to do it for me. Now he wants to expose the roles of auditing giant KPMG and consultancy group PwC in the scheme. Do you think KPMG should have picked something up? Absolutely. Absolutely. We know how influential the big four accounting firms are in the public sector. I really do see these consultants as an infestation. They are going from uh, senior levels in consultant firms and then into you know, senior executive positions in government. They made at least $10 billion in government contracts over the past decade. The big four are enormously powerful. Their tentacles spread across the whole of big business, globally and locally, and that power is unchecked, untransparent, invisible. The operations of these giants in the private sector have received little public scrutiny. They're making huge profits from auditing the same companies they're consulting. It's risky business. When they tell the truth, proper decision making can be undertaken about where to make investments. When they fudge the truth, when they don't take their job seriously, we all stand to lose really significantly. The impact on our retirement of poor decision making is very, very real. Good. I think that's a good point a to start. Staggering right? nine. Yeah, because yeah. it touches on a couple of things, like just blatant fraud, right? Blatant mining and fraud. It touches on the the dance, right? Where you know, hey, I work for Big Four. Now I'm working for the government. Now I'm back at Big Four. Maybe I'm in the PC. In our case, in our country, the IRS and the PCAOB, and then the whole, um, you know, the, the third part where they just, you know, they're issuing Consulting. contracts. They're consulting. Doing the consulting and the audits in the same firm, same firm, right? Which creates an inherent conflict of interest that you cannot address with these ethics trainings. <laughs> you, yeah. you mean uh, the 20 page PDF does not help yeah. cure that? So, if the national leadership in accounting wants to improve the image of accounting, you got to address these issues because. In Australia, in particular, it's reached mainstream news, mainstream consciousness, and the public has lost their trust. And here in the United States, I would say it hasn't reached that level yet, but all it takes is another Enron. And the way we're trending, I don't know if we have actually solved the problems that led to Enron. When you look at PCAOB deficiency rates, it's very worrying that 40% of audits are deficient according to the PCAOB. And I know we've talked to Jerry McGinnis, partner at KPMG, former office managing partner who, you know, he told us, oh, he thinks the PCAOB, to paraphrase, they're, they're being a little too tough. But I mean, that's a really bad number. So we've reached out to the PCAOB to try to 
understand what those deficiencies mean? Does it really mean that these audits are super shaky? What is it? What is exactly is the situation of audit in the United States? Is it protecting investors, or should we be worried? But to get back to the whole talent crisis discussion, you can't improve the image of accounting when the foundation is cracked. I'm mixing metaphors there, <laughs> but I think you understand what I mean. Yeah, and I mean, there's yeah. You think about the whole fun, and we we had a big discussion about this at the conference, and the whole. You know the working conditions, right? And oh yeah, there, working there's a lot of ironic too. cracks, right? And, and even that makes ESG look silly. How can, how how can the accounting bodies be pushing for ESG when they can't get the firms to treat employees properly? Like how, that's that's governance, right? And environmental that fits in that umbrella. Yeah. So toxic workplaces yeah. fit under ESG in the governance side of things, under the social side of things. It's part of it. That's why Tesla has gotten hammered by some of these ESG funds because of how they treat workers. So, yeah, you've got, it's going to be a weird situation where you have big four firms auditing about ESG, and they themselves would probably do pretty poorly on ESG, given how much they make people travel, for one thing, with all the environmental problems of travel, and then the social problems of people overworking and dying at their desks, and getting divorced, and having no social the, lives, and being physically unfit. The trees, and being stressed out, and having high blood pressure, and partners dying within five years of retiring. You know, it's not just a staff thing. The partners are overworked more than the staff even. They're prisoners of the system themselves. They may be making a lot of money, but they're stuck in a lot of ways too. Golden handcuffs. Uh, <laughs> so I had some articles that tie to this a little bit because they bring this up, this dance, the back and forth, because this was this, this kid on a lot of the headlines this week, and I saw sure. it. The IRS agents are getting paid by private accounting firms and, you know, people go back and forth and there's a study that came out and this was issued by the uh, uh, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, TIGTA, T-I-G-T-A. And this new report came out and basically 496 IRS employees were identified with connections to large accounting firms or corporations. Of these, 241 had ties to accounting firms and 255 to corporations. And again, this is that, and guess who's involved in this? article and the releases elizabeth warren right and again so, it's that it's this like there's the potential for wrongdoing but there's actually no wrongdoing that they're calling out so i have to ask you something are these currently employed irs agents it looks like this is current numbers from what so i can these tell are, from the article okay so these are people working at the irs who have ties back to corporations yeah. or uh, or, or current-ish, because, or I mean, it probably is hard to right. do, so maybe it's right. 2021 or 2022, yeah. but it's current-ish. Um, and the IRS said they responded with plans to strengthen its ethics training and review the case of the management systems, right? And, and this is fine, and I, and I didn't think it was that big of an article, but coincidentally, a week and a half ago, I had an article that we never really made the show. So a couple of weeks back, Elizabeth Warren, and um, let me switch back. Katie uh, Porter, Democrat from California, right? They sent letters to the executives of Intuit, H&R Block, and American Coalition for Taxpayers' Rights, and the Free File Alliance, demanding a lot of information because, and basically, it's they're trying to attack the lobbying of this, of the, uh, of these companies, the lobbying, the these lobbying companies spend, are doing. right? But they specifically asked this question, and I noted it last week, so. They were demanding in all these letters, and this is from the Intuit letter. Since January twenty January first of twenty twenty one, how many Intuit employees or external partners have previously worked for the federal government in tax policy or other positions in the IRS or the Treasury Department, the Federal Trade Commission, or elsewhere in the executive branch? For each of these employees, please provide the following. And like this is big demand list, right? How much revenue mm -hmm. will you lose if we launch a free tax file thing? And it's just it's a typical Elizabeth Warren letter of nothing, right? Well. I made a note. I literally made a note last. I was like, she should have these numbers. Like, how does she not have this? And then two weeks later, a week and a half later, they announced they have these numbers. But now, now this makes me think, if they really know these 500 people have done all this and she's involved in the press release of this, she already knows if Intuit has employees doing it or not. So either it's a, it's a nothing burger, because I'm assuming, let's say Intuit had 50 employees working for the IRS, former employees. I think she, that would be the headline of this. Right, unless she's mm -hmm. you know, slow playing her card or something. So I feel like the letter she wrote two weeks ago to the executives is a big nothing burger. 
It's just, it's full. Like, it's funny how like sometimes a show, uh, an article, like you recognize something in it, but it doesn't come together until two weeks. We see a different article and I'm like, oh, all right, this is all tied together. But again, it's, it's the, what, let me read the quote here. That, that, uh, so this is, this is from the TIGTA TIG report. While not a direct correlation, this can raise impartial, impartiality concerns. So again, it's like, you know, but, but, but Elizabeth Warren says accounting giants are abusing the public trust and taking advantage of the revolving door. So I, I don't know. Well, we'll see. But yeah. No, but again, this is an article that ties back, like you say, the foundation, right? How do we how do we have good images like on Wheel of Fortune yeah. and then have articles like this? Yeah. Well, the term the term for what you're describing is regulatory capture. And that's when private industry makes its way into the regulators and gets the regulations the way they want them. And then this you bring those people back. This going on the history of time. We've talked about yeah. this with the PCOB yeah. and everywhere. All, all, well, and, and it's not and, just our industry, right? Yeah. No, it's not just our industry, but it's it's happening in accounting and we know it's happening. And uh, that's, how, that's why you, know, you, you could make the conclusion that the reason that accounting standards haven't advanced is because there's, the big four have captured the SEC and the PCAOB and get them to do what they want. And they don't want anything to change because change costs them money. They like it to stay exactly the way it is. All right, let's get to tech because we haven't talked about tech yet. And there have been some really cool advancements in AI, examples of accountants using AI to create entirely new services, to automate services in their firms, and even to automate advisory. And I know everyone wants to do advisory. We all want to become CFOs and not be bookkeepers. And the question always is, how do you do that at scale? How do you provide insights into financials when there aren't a lot of people who can do that kind of work? And our friend, Ryan Lozanis, did an incredible demo in a Loom video. And I want to play this for you. Again, it's a little long. It's five, six minutes. So I might skip around a bit to show you what he's doing. Um, in essence, he has figured out how to use AI to create an analysis of a set of financial statements for a client and then voice cloning technology to deliver a video with a narrative of going through the financials. So this is like a second level because I've heard about some accountants that are like, oh, I, I learned to scale a little bit better because what I do is I just record a loom and I just read through the financials and just send them the loom and that's it. He's like leveled that up. He's like, I'm not even going to be on the loom. <laughs> I'll just put right. my AI version of me on the loom. Okay. Right, right. And so right now it's just an AI voice, but there are these AI avatar generators that uh, are very soon going to be available off the shelf. So you could generate loom videos with AI potentially. Now I'm not actually I know, here, Blake. I'm 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 actually not here. <laughs> and that's the next level is that's the that's the really scary future in which you can have a live avatar and when you join a Zoom meeting with a sales rep, you don't know if that sales rep is real or not. Um, maybe the shibboleth will become popular again. There will be a you'll have to test the avatar with a special word that they can't say unless they're human. Or something. Anyway, yeah. I'm getting beyond myself. Let's let's watch Ryan Lazanis's video, and uh, if you like this, you'll like his newsletter. Search Future Firm newsletter, and you can subscribe and get this kind of stuff in your inbox. Thanks, Ryan, for the video. Completely. I'm just trying to demonstrate what the process looks like. There's definitely improvements we can make to it. But let's say you have uh, a health checkup service that you provide. Health checkup service is something that I recommend you provide to your clients. It's basically an analysis of your client's past results based on a certain period and some suggestions on how they can improve in the future. It's a very simple service that you can add and it helps you be proactive and it's a value add for your clients. So let's say we're gonna analyze the previous three months, the previous quarter, and I'm pulling this up in zero. He's got a PNL on the screen. What I do is I would export this to um, an Excel document. I would then go into ChatGPT and I would uh, make sure that code interpreter is enabled. You'd have to have uh, GPT-4, I believe, for this to be enabled. And then this is a very simple prompt, and honestly, it's, we can make it a lot better than this. But here I'm just saying you're an accountant who advises clients on how to grow their business, increase their profits, attaches a profit and loss statement for the last three months. Please analyze this uh, P&L, explain to your client the main risks and opportunities, actionable steps that they can take to improve their business and profits. 
I think we can really drastically improve this, but this is the simplest prompt that I very quickly came up with. And here, let's, uh, let's say, so, so ChatGPT then analyzed the file and came up with some risks, opportunities, and I'm not suggesting you copy and paste all this stuff, but I'm just gonna do it for example purposes. I think we could use ChatGPT to kind of uh, um, expedite the analysis process and then add our own flair to it. Uh, add our own, uh, there might be some stuff that ChatGPT simply doesn't get right. You'd have to know your client obviously well enough. We don't wanna just, we don't want a robot doing the analysis for you 100% of the way, but we want to use the robot to help um, to help speed things up. So what Ryan is showing on the screen is ChatGPT's response to his prompt, which has some analysis, such as there's a significant drop in sales from July to August. This could indicate an underlying issue with product demand or market conditions. And maybe identify some things that we might have missed. So we would copy and paste this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this into my voice cloning service, 11 laps. And again, uh, I'm copying and pasting here for uh, example purposes. Um, for example purposes only, but I'm suggesting that we should take this and make it a bit of our own, okay? So here. So he's, he's copied and pasted into a text box in 11 labs, which is the voice cloning technology service. Uh, here are the main risks and opportunities. So now he's typing in, he's cleaning up the transcript a little bit that it's generated. But using his verbiage, just, right? Yeah, that using, he would using, actually say. yeah. Let me just. Now, if you improve the prompt and gave it your tone of voice, if you were able to train it, you then said, it could possibly said, generate a script your Canadian in the style. Account. A Canadian yes. account. Yeah. All right. So I took 30 seconds to very quickly massage this text. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate my voice. So I'll put this on pause while my voice generates and we'll take a look in a moment. Okay. So now I have generated my, uh, uh, um, my voice for all this text that ChatGPT outputted, which ideally we are massaging. And now what we can do is we could simply pull up the um, we can simply pull up the um, the profit and loss, and uh, we could have a loom video, which ideally would be video off in this instance, and then we can uh, all right simply let's dive right into this profit and loss statement you provided. We'll take a look at the numbers and find the main risks and opportunities. Then we'll map out actionable steps to steer your business towards more growth and profits. So that voice you're hearing in the background now, that's the cloned voice. Yeah. It sounds pretty close. Most people can't tell the difference. Here are the main risks and opportunities. That's because Ryan has risks, a natural tone that's a little robotic anyway, so that, that tone and rhythm. <laughs> so <laughs> it works really well, actually, for him. It, it works great. This could indicate an underlying issue with product demand or... So I won't go through the whole thing here, but you can see how at some point in time, we're going to be able to use a combination of chat GPT, screen sharing, and a voice clone uh, with some involvement, obviously, on your end to uh, massage, uh, massage whatever is being outputted from chat GPT. Um, to actually scale up how we provide advice and how we communicate with our clients. And so obviously it's a lot of copy paste right now, a lot of switching between apps, but imagine if you automated this to some extent where financials get generated, a script is generated, a human reviews the script and approves it, the voice is generated and added to a video of the profit and loss. Well, yeah, I mean, I think this is a, an opportunity for some either an app developer or you could have, um, you know, all these companies that, that specialize in building accountant or CPA websites. Mm -hmm. Like th this could be a service they, they sell. Like, hey, Ann, yeah. we will take time. We will clone you and, and connect all these pipes so you can pump out, you know, it, it totally could be built. Somebody could build this. Yeah. This and, to me is way more valuable than a dashboard. But, but somebody has to prove that accountants even care about getting this in there. I'm sorry, clients, clients care about getting this and they're oh. going to do something with it. And at the end of Whoops. the day, that's going to really push. Again, it's like dashboards and other stuff, like things get created and 
do do business owners even want this? You know, at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, I think they I think they want the email analysis. They want a high level analysis that comes with yeah. the financial statements. If you're just sending a PDF, that PDF never gets opened because busy entrepreneurs do not have time to read financial statements. Yeah. 90% of them. So in my network of accounting firm owners, the ones who are doing advisory, the number one thing they're doing that sounds really smart to me is provide an executive summary in the email. So in the email, here's five bullet points. Here's what you need to know this month about your financials. And if you want to dig in more, it's an email or a text. It's it's clean. It's like what we send out to each, what I send out for us with uh, using Finn daily. It's just like six bullets. Here's the bank balance. Boom, boom, boom. And that's it. Yeah. Every day we get that or, but yeah, or even more, could you do it in a text to people? Like, yeah. Think they... Or um, a loom video with the tax return. That's what a lot of firms are doing now. Yeah. So I give you the five, 10 minute loom video, walking you through the return. Here's what you need to know. If you have any questions, make a comment or schedule time with me. So that's, that's already happening and this can automate it further, make it, make it more scalable yeah. because making those loom videos, only the preparer or the partner can do that, not not the staff, but they could prep the video, right? They could prep the script, even. Yeah. All right. Um, I got another video to play. Here's another cool AI application that I saw. Uh, this is called. What is it even called? I'm just gonna start playing the video, and we'll find out. <laughs> Let's see here. This is called Tax Genie. This is Tax Genie considering a complex tax scenario and query, carrying out deep legislation research and pr- producing what appears to be a logical and accurate conclusion. And is this one of those chat GPTs where they pre-trained it on lots of tax regulations or something? I believe so. Okay. It's quite a significant update here. And apologies, the, the recording on the video is super boomy, and it sounds like they're in a big glass conference room. I can't do anything about that. You have to make sure that you just scan your way through what I'm doing. So just pause it and you can read. I guess we have to pause and read. So here's the scenario given. Okay. Here's the scenario given to Tax Genie is on 1 July, 2023, James Family Trust will dispose of the units held in Damon Enterprises Unit Trust. Capital gains earned by James Family Trust will be distributed to Edwards J. Enterprises Party Limited. There will be no ordinary income to distribute. Calculate the indirect small business participation percentage held by Edward James. The response is, given the scenario and legislation detailing direct small business participation percentage and indirect small business participation percentage, we need several steps to calculate them. And then it goes through multiple steps and calculates, you know, the answer for this. And it gets it to the percentages. So I guess I won't play the video because the audio is terrible. Um, but I think it's an interesting, you know, specific application of AI uh, for tax planning purposes, right? For what we do as accountants and tax professionals. And this kind of specifically trained LLM technology is going to become super common because it's super valuable. And I think we're going to see something like this. I think next week we're attending some Intuit uh, investor presentation, and they're going to basically Intuit's going to debut some sort of AI thing next week. We're going to see that via, I guess it's kind of like a webinar. We'll be attending, and, and we'll see that, what that is. It's but a I think live the specific ones. Yeah, notice that they don't call it a webinar. It's like a digital event. Yes, it's a, but it's basically a webinar. Yeah. Webinar. Um, Should we talk about a new podcast that we are helping to launch? The first episode is out. The unofficial QuickBooks Accountants Podcast with Hector Garcia and Alicia Katz-Pollock is now up, and you can get it on your podcast players, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen. You can also go to unofficialquickbooksaccountantspodcast.transistor.fm and listen. It's super awesome. David, tell us more about this show. I mean, if you're a QuickBooks Pro Advisor and you want to stay in the loop of everything happening, QuickBooks, Intuit Accountants related, you want to listen to this podcast. Because even like on our own show, you know, there's there's so much news. Like in, in Intuit has 
stuff coming out all the time. I think I have five Intuit things in my my queue right now, and they're probably not going to make the show, but they'll make this show for sure. Yep. Right? The quick, very specific to QuickBooks and what's affecting the QuickBooks Pro Advisor. Small business owners could listen, but it's really probably going to be that Pro Advisor community. Yeah. So Hector and Alicia are going to do this every month. Episodes will come out weekly, biweekly, all the latest news on QuickBooks. So yeah, if you use QuickBooks, you need to subscribe to this podcast. Hector is indeed the man. Dark Horse CPAs says that in the live chat. I couldn't agree more. Uh, no better expert on QuickBooks in the world. And he's got millions and millions of YouTube views on his QuickBooks videos. And, and it's very clearly branded unofficial QuickBooks, unlike this next story I'm going to talk about, Blake. What's the next <laughs> story you're going to talk about, David? So I think anybody who's ran uh, a Facebook group, a LinkedIn group, if anybody posts to Twitter or Facebook, LinkedIn, you ever put the word QuickBooks and you start getting these spam posts and your, your, the, the replies and it's like, um, actually I can share my screen. I'll show you the kind of how these feel a little bit. Let's share the screen. Now this is why I stopped using a lot of these groups. Share screen, window, share screen, that's my Twitter. And you get these posts that are like QuickBooks payroll, P-A-Y-R-O-L. Right? And it's called QuickBooks Payroll Support, right? This Twitter handle. And they have these ad, the, these these like really janky kind of half-ass ads. It's got the phone number and it says QuickBooks Payroll Support Phone. They're, they're, they show up over and over again. They get posted all over. I, and the funny thing, I had a hard time finding because I've spent a decade blocking these all over social every time I get posted by one of these things. But yeah. even in my my own Feedly, um, because I pick, I search for the word QuickBooks when I prepare for the show, and I had to block this one phone number because it just keeps popping up everywhere over and over again. Well, basically, what happened now? Finally, the Department wait, wait, wait. of Justice. Sorry, sorry Dave. Oh, hold on. What yeah. is why? What are these posts? Why, why are why is somebody spamming QuickBooks and support all over the Be, internet? Because it's wondered. a scam. It's a scam. Oh, so so it's okay. so it's a scam. They pretend. So how how does it they, work? They, the, the way the scam works is they. It's just like those Microsoft scams. Like you have a problem on your Windows computer. Give me your credit card. I'll help you fix it. You know, everybody's seen these scams floating around the internet, but these are very okay. specific to QuickBooks and small business. So the Department of Justice just arrested somebody uh, yesterday in connection to this. He scammed more than 7,000 victims in the US market for a total of $13 million. And so people it. are looking for the QuickBooks support number and they find his scam post and they call that number and they get scammed out of money? Yes, and, they, and some of it maybe it's, it's overcharging them for support. And so, he's, so he, has, he operates his companies, some of them is uh, Feb Software Services, Feb Software Services, PN Bookkeeping Services, Feb's Consulting, QuickBooks Tech, Tech Assist, QuickBooks US, QuickBooks Accounting, QuickBooks Support Team. Like these are the companies, so he presents himself as being some official QuickBooks support thing. And I don't think he's the only company doing it. I think there's so many of these happening, but they've uh, arrested him and he, they're going to get him on wire fraud and uh, essentially 20 years in prison um, or uh, twice the gross profit caused by the offenses. And they, uh, but he, they basically trick people who don't know, small business owners and uh. elderly to pay a lot of extra money for tech support. They probably don't even fix the problem. Right. right, and he pretends they're he, they pretend they're QuickBooks or into it. It's just this has been happening for a decade. These these stupid posts on social media over and over again. I've always wondered what that was, and now you now you have taught me, David. Thank you. And, Mystery and I, solved. It, this is we should all be celebrating. Like these should go away. That the Department of Justice is like crank cramp. Cr I should actually go unmute all everybody and see if it actually stops or if a different company pops up to do all this. Whack a mole, right? Whack -a -mole. Probably. Uh, I have some listener mail, two messages before we go. Perfect. Got anything else, David? Okay. So this is from Sean. Sean said, hi, Blake. I'm a big fan of the growing family of podcasts. Thank you for all you've done to elevate and modernize the profession. On the accounting podcast, the topic of the accounting shortage regularly comes up. I wonder, though, is it a shortage or a resource allocation problem? I ask because my specialty is small and mid-sized nonprofits. I've gotten to see a lot of situations where CPAs end up doing a lot of bookkeeper and other duties that do not require specialized skills. That leaves me wondering if the future of accounting is just one where we see CPAs used surgically, basically just in situations where they need their specialized training. Does that make sense? Does that align with your experience? Best, Sean. 
David, I'll let you go first. Does that make sense? And does that align with your experience? Well, I think I, if I'm kind of getting the vibe of what, what he's talking about. So here's the new world, like peas coming in. Uh, we talked about this before, people are buying cash practices, but, every, but some function of that business is going to need an accountant. And maybe accountants are just like mercenaries, there's free agents, like, hey, I need a CPA, and I'm just going to bring in a CPA for this one little thing I need mm -hmm. in my practice, and then that CPA is going to be a mercenary somewhere else. They're just like free agents or mercenaries that just come in and like do this one thing or this one piece of the bigger picture. They don't do it they don't actually run a business there's mercenaries mm. maybe that's that's the vibe i'm getting in my what went through my head yeah i mean we've definitely seen that fewer cpas needed for specific jobs i uh i i mean we just talked about it in the show in cast practices the fastest growing segment of accounting outsourced accounting it's 50 percent or less are cpas and my concern with that is that if they aren't cpas then they aren't regulated and they aren't held to the same professional standard. And so if we want to maintain high quality as a profession, as an accounting profession, we need as a lot of the accountants out there to be CPAs. And if it's only a small group, then we can't protect the public. So we need to make it more accessible. We need to take away the red tape so more people want to be CPAs and want to be held to those high standards. That's that's my main concern. And 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 that counters the argument that, oh, it's good when we don't have a lot of CPAs because our wages go up. Well, no, I don't think they do because as we have fewer CPAs, the value of the CPA will decline because it will become less omnipresent in the mind of the public. They'll stop thinking, I need a CPA for this. And they'll start saying, maybe I don't need a CPA for this. And when they start doing that for lots of stuff, that's when we are in trouble as a license. Do you think, um, in, in the same way I think uh, when it comes to regulation, right, and needing to be licensed, and, and I think the, the big story is like why do you, uh, when people that want to have a hair braiding business, they have to get licensed just to braid hair, right? And do you think that might be the way to get more people to become CPAs? Is that you can't practice cash practices now unless you have a CPA license. Do you think, do you think there's, people in the profession possibly pushing for that legislation that from that direction to, instead of it just I'm, being signing on no. audits, it's more things. I, it would be, I think it would be better if it were, it's certainly be better for CPAs if like you needed a CPA to do more things. And I don't understand why the leaders in our profession aren't advocating for that. That seems like it should be one of the top things they advocate for. Um, some states are better about it than others, at least in terms of using the term accountant. In Texas, you can't say you're an accountant practicing to the public unless you're also a CPA or working in a CPA firm. So that really increases the value of being a CPA firm or being a CPA is that other your competitors can't call themselves accountants unless they're also CPAs. They have to call themselves something else like consultants. Um, so, you know, yeah. I'm worried. I'm I'm worried that CPAs will become too niche, and then, then the value plummets. The reason that it was so val it became so valuable over many many years is because almost every accountant became a CPA, and now that's less and less and less likely. That's just my, that's my feeling. Yeah, and I think in New York they just uh, after a decade pushed they uh, over. Uh, overwhelmingly approved is the verbiage here. They're going to permit non-CPA ownership of CPA forms in New York. So. Which, which is, it, now it still requires 51%, and that's the way it is in the other states that allow non-CPAs okay. to own CPA firms, which I think is good. I th but I think, like, we got to keep it over that 51% for licensure, you know, for CPA firm ownership. We got to be the majority, and ideally it should be, like, you know, two-thirds, if two thirds of accountants were CPAs, that would really go a long way to protecting the public because we can hold them to a higher standard than non-licensed professionals. And, you know, let's toss in the others there too. Like I'm not, I don't want to leave out enrolled agents You're and certified management accountants. You're now that you just renewed your CPA. You've gotten very, very <laughs> Well, I, I just spent my, just sent in my $275 ACH payment. Right. Actually, they let me use a credit card. That was nice to relicense. So I got to get my value. All right, here's a message from Glenn. David, I mean David Glenn. Hello, Blake and David. I'm a regular listener and actually shook David's hand at AICP Engage a couple months ago. 
I hear the 150 hour brought up quite regularly and wanted to share my thoughts. I think we need to be more granular in terms of what services are being provided and what the minimum education requirement should be for those services. I think for CPAs who provide bookkeeping type services like Blake did, the 150 hour requirement is too high. You can learn all you need to learn in undergrad and are perfectly qualified to do that type of work. For CPAs who provide tax services, I think the current requirements are actually too low. As it stands now, someone could get licensed as a CPA and provide tax services using the CPA brand while only taking a single tax class. At the end of undergrad in finance degree, at the end of undergrad in a finance degree, I pivoted into an accounting career by getting a master's degree in tax. Having that dedicated year of training to get a solid foundation in tax has been invaluable to me. I see way too many unqualified CPAs doing taxes who just don't know many of the basics that they would know had they been required to get a master's in tax to use the CPA brand in their practice. On the flip side, I'm legally allowed to issue audit opinions, but I'm woefully unqualified to do so since I lack any training in that area. I did pass the audit section right on the number with a 75. I enjoy the show and keep up the good work. And David Glenn brings up a great point. Thanks for listening. It is crazy that you can practice tax as a CPA only taking one tax class. Like, it, it, it just shows like the state of things. Like, I think there's this, and this goes, I don't want to spin this off in the 150 hour stuff, but, but the argument and the point of view is like, everything's working perfectly. And it's very obvious. Like there's also, there's holes in all of this everywhere. Yeah. So like, it doesn't matter if South Carolina does a little bit or Minnesota does a little bit that it, it's very fractured already. Yeah, but no, but that, but nobody admits that. It's like an emperor has no clothes kind of situation, where everybody sees it, but nobody's willing to admit it at the levels of the profession where anything can actually get done. It's just all us small firm owners sitting here watching these clowns in suits and ties. That's how it feels sometimes. Like, what are they saying? This doesn't match up with anything. We all know it's broken. I, I don't know. So, so how do you, is it just coming out and maybe like, hey, we realized that, or, or you know, this goes back to like the CPA plus like concept, of like it's CPA plus, like, do you, are there extra letters you start sticking on? You know, there's a T because you've, you've taken the, a year of tax, not just one class of tax. Because I, I think that's the bigger issue of all this is me as a consumer or a small business owner, I see the CPA, I assume you're good at accounting, taxes, maybe on it like in general the it's usually taxes right right that's the funny part the, the public yeah. associates the cpa most with taxes and yet we don't have very much in the way of requirements for cpas to do taxes it's all about financial account a lot of it's financial accounting and um audit i mean there's one section of the cpa exam that's tax so you got to know that to practice but arguably eas have better tax experience and training because of that exam than, than CPAs do. It's more focused. That's the argument I've heard EAs make, and CPAs but really don't actually, like that. Actually, I heard that. an argument from somebody at the ACPA uh, at this conference that said, but, you know, EAs don't have to take a business class. <laughs> so I don't know. Like, like they, they, yeah. EAs don't have to take any classes. I, I, uh, it's the just, lesson I here know. is I, I don't know what the solution is, but I know that the situation is – doesn't make sense yeah admitting admitting so. where we're at is probably the step one yes well you gotta admit when you have a problem to fix it all right we should let everybody it, get on to their holiday weekend here yes i hope you have a great labor day weekend david don't work too hard that's like the main point of the holiday so everybody listening should actually take time off that was one of my favorite sessions at the conference by the way was i forget the speaker's name i feel bad about that but he was talking about how you you know, putting work before life, you'll never have enough time for life. Oh, and then Nayo Carter Gray did a session on how to actually take a vacation, which I thought was very valuable, how to take a vacation and enjoy it. As an accountant, it can be really challenging to do that. And so she gave really good tips on how to actually take a vacation. Uh, so. You know, um, Amy Vetter had her talk. And it's funny because I don't go to conferences a lot I don't sit in the sessions very often. So, a, I don't need CPE, but usually 
I'm working the sales floor and the sales floor is gigantic and it takes days to talk to everybody you need to talk to. And so I went to a lot of sessions. So I saw John Garrett, which was nice and Amy Vetter. And then I'm in Amy Vetter's session, which is really a little bit focused at disconnecting and focusing on the, on the human side of these things. And I'm the only idiot in there, like an asshole working on my laptop, you know, <laughs> so take trying a vacation, to get, trying to get the QuickBooks podcast launched, the unofficial QuickBooks podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Beautiful. everyone, who joined us live. Always fun to have you. Subscribe on YouTube. Get notified when we go live. And you can email us, theaccountingpodcast at earmark.me. That's theaccountingpodcast at earmark.me. Or just head into the show notes to find out how you can reach out to us. We love getting stories from our listeners. That's where I got most of the stories for this episode, was our listeners sending me links to that, that video from Australia. Thank you so much to our listener who sent that in. And with that, let's go enjoy the week.